I listened to Abel Croy and I created Scientopedia and I have a very important video podcast for you today. It's about the history of Scientology and I think answers the question for the main reason why Scientology had to be taken down. But we'll get to that. Now, if you see behind me here, uh, it's a banner for the movie Third Eye Spies, which was produced by Russell Targ, my guest today. I'll be talking to Russell about uh, a special person in, that's featured in that movie named Pat Price. Pat was a, well, he was a Scientologist and an OT, but he was also a superstar remote viewer. And he made some people in powerful positions very nervous because of some of the things he came up with. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, the remote viewing experiments were mainly created or powered by some Scientologists. Now, Russell Targ is not a Scientologist, but he's familiar with Dianetics and so forth. But he, along with Hal Pudup, who was a Scientologist, created the remote or started the remote viewing experiments, followed in shortly thereafter by Ingo Swan. Now, Ingo Swan had attracted a lot of attention because he was able to make a very highly sensitive device that was buried deep under the ground. He was able to make that device twitch or move. It wasn't supposed to happen because it was very deep, like I said, and it was designed to only measure uh, atomic events around the world. So the fact that he was able to psychically make that device move got the attention of the CIA and got them a lot of funding to go ahead and pursue their experimentation. Now, obviously I'm making a long story very, very short here, but a lot of information about remote viewing on the internet. I created a three-part series, which will be linked to here um, that you can check out. And uh, so you can bring yourself up to speed. You can watch the movie and maybe you'll be more interested in this stuff after you hear what I have to say to Russell Targ. Now, Russell <clears throat> talked to me, or I talked to him about the same time this movie had, was coming out, and I told him some things that he didn't know, as well as he told me a few things that I didn't know about Pat Price and that whole uh, era. Now, Pat Price, like I said, was a superstar remote viewer. He was famous for drawing big elaborate gantries and devices that the Soviets were working on. And they were of course top secret. This is back in the Cold War era in the early seventies. Uh, among other things, Pat uh, was talking about UFO bases and you know, secret Soviet listening devices off the coast of California and <laughs> all kinds of things. Now, why did I know Pat Price? Well, his, he was a Scientologist, like I said, and his wife was friends with my girlfriend. So we ended up sharing a house in Hollywood and Pat would be off doing uh, the remote viewing experiments. And then later uh, he told me he was going to work for a coal exploration company when in actual fact, well, he did do that, but he was also uh, working on the East Coast for the CIA. And there's some things that he came up with, which I think is what got him killed. Now, the fact that uh, he died in 1975, many people have looked at it and realized that it's very suspicious the way things happen. Um, and so you'll notice in the beginning of my talk with Russell Targ, he mentions that he didn't want, didn't think it was smart for me to publish this on the internet since we were talking about someone's potential murder and it was only recently that he gave me the blessing to go ahead and publish it. I told Russell a couple of things that he did not know, as well as he knows remote viewing and knew Pat Price, he did not know what I had to tell him. I also asked him if, see the remote viewing experiments were the most thorough investigation into psychic abilities that's ever been done. They tested ungodly amounts and came up with reams of data proving that outside of the normal or average or what could be expected by random that in fact you know some people had abilities that were not normal well i speculated my thesis is that if you had 
a group of Scientologists that were able to demonstrate these extra normal abilities and you had an organization that could produce such people, would that be enough of a threat to, let's call it the cabal, the cartel, the deep state, whatever, would that be enough to motivate them to infiltrate and put a stop to that organization from producing more of these types of individuals? Russell, not a Scientologist, like I said, agreed with me. You'll hear it on this tape. There was another point that he didn't know, and I think it, it sheds light on the even more motivation beyond things like uh, Pat Price and Ingle Swan had penetrated a secret remote NSA facility and come out with code names and uh, project names and information about some NSA projects, as well as Russian or Soviet era information. So um, this would uh, just stand a reason that certain powers that be would be very nervous about having a guy on the loose like that. Anyway, I want to ask you to please subscribe, uh, like this video, and also become a patron for as little as $1, $3, $5, whatever you can uh, feel comfortable with, you can help me make more of these videos. There's several in the pipeline. They take time, they take money, they take effort. So supporting us would really make uh, a world of difference. And uh, with that, I'm going to move right on and let you listen to my discussion with Russell Targ and David LaCroix. Thank you. Hi, Russell. This is David. This is David. Well, thank you very much for calling back. Well, I'm uh, glad to be able to speak with you. Um, can I first just ask you, is it okay with you if I make this uh, as a podcast? Let's see. Uh, I don't have any monetary. I don't get paid for it. It's just I don't. Uh, it, it, may, it may be dangerous. So, um I think that might be, you could record it and then let's see what comes out. <laughs> I like the way you're thinking. <laughs> uh, you I, I think that it's probably not good to make a podcast. Right. We, 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 we think that somebody probably be murdered. We think that uh, someone has been murdered and uh, I have no way to protect myself. Yeah. Well, so, so you you can make a recording for your own purposes, but don't put it on the internet. I got you. Okay, understood. Uh and agreed. And then, you know, if we want to circle back and do something else, maybe um we'll see. Um but uh yeah, the um the seriousness of the topic is definitely uh been on my mind uh Actually, since I, you know, heard of Pat's death, for example, you know, uh, I, you know, I smelled a rat just like uh, I did. Why uh, don't I tell you what I know for true? Okay. And then we can go. Pat, Pat was doing extremely successful psychic stuff with us. Right. And then in end of July of 74, CIA said, See, I now have more information for making the film. They were nervous about Price being with us because we were sort of cheerful ESP enthusiasts in California, and Price had shown himself to be Superman, that he could read documents in a secure safe and describe anything else, which means that he could read launch codes for the president and fire a missile or give the launch codes to the Russians. But he, so he became very dangerous. Right. So, but so they moved him to Virginia, and he was in Virginia for about five months doing daily remote viewing with Ken Kress 
spying on foreign nationals, including going into foreign embassies. It's all in my that's all in my film. Okay. Now, two years later, we learned. We always knew that Price was a Scientologist. It's a free country. He can be a Scientologist if he wants to be. Two years later, after his death, some of the world learned that Price was daily handing over the top secret briefings from Ken Kress and giving it to a Scientology auditor. Right. That was discovered when the FBI broke into the Scientology Celebrity Center. Yep. And Ken Chris then wrote a lengthy paper denouncing all of us and said Price was not a psychic because he claimed to be a traitor to his country and so forth. Oh. And he published that. Oh, wow. I didn't know about that. Now, the question is, did people at the... See, Price was a pretty smart guy, but he wasn't a trained spy. So the question is, uh, did the CIA surveil him at his little farmhouse as he would daily meet with or talk to his Scientology auditor? Right. I, I would think that if you've got a uncleared person doing top secret work in a bizarre area that you'd want to know who he's talking to. That's just me speaking. Right. So I am conjecturing that the Scientologists quickly caught on to the fact uh, that Superman was a double agent. I don't know that. But as a scientist, that seems reasonable to me. Uh, I'm a little confused. You mean the double agent working for someone other than the U.S. government? Yeah, also working for the – that is, he's working for the U.S. government in top secret stuff. And we know for a fact that he was handing it over to Scientology. Oh. I, which is a very, very bad thing to do with top secret material. Right. And uh, – and that might have presented a problem for them. Oh, I'm sure it did. But, um, you know, I'm going to go into it. And I'll tell you a little bit. You may be have also, he may have also mentioned it to you at the time. But So I've now told you everything I know. Okay. <laughs> well, at that time when he was uh, working for the CIA, of course, I knew him. Uh, his wife, uh, through his wife, my girlfriend, they were friends. We... Uh, I thought his wife's name was Anne. Um, wasn't, he, wasn't he married to a nurse? Yeah, and she was a Scientologist. She was living. They they got a house in. Uh, we got a house in Hollywood, which was just a matter of a few blocks from that Hollywood Celebrity Center, um, uh, just off Franklin Boulevard there in Hollywood, and um, so at the time I was just going to say, you know, compare notes in the same time frame, he told me that he was working for a coal exploration company. That's right, Princess Coal Company. Okay, so I, I, you know, later on, I figured that was just a short story when I, because I didn't, he didn't say, hey, I'm working for the CIA, you know. <laughs> yeah, Scientology put him in charge of, Scientologists made him president of the Princess Coal Company. Okay for which he had zero experience. Right. Well, he was supposedly he was at, you know, using his psychic ability to find deposits um, was what, you know, he led me to believe was why he was hired there. But, you know, uh, he was also at the same time working for the CIA and a lot of things. Did you know that? That he was working for the CIA? Yeah. I didn't at the time, no. I just, uh, you know, and all you know, that's come out through you and I guess other people uh, that he was in their employ. But so, uh, yeah, so you knew about you knew that he was moved moved to Virginia working for the Princess Coal Company, but you didn't know about the CIA connection. Right, he was at that time. He was obviously maintaining a couple of residences, because like I said, his wife was getting auditing, 
and living in Hollywood um, and up until... Now, well, you had a different name for his wife than something you wrote to me. Now, I thought her name was Ann. You know, I, I it's been so long, I hadn't thought about it in so many years. I, I think Ann sounds right. Um, I mean, he only had one wife, so... If you, okay. Um, I, you know, was closer to... I mean, my girlfriend's name was Barbara, and the connection... Because it's come up, you know, whether or not L. Ron Hubbard knew about remote viewing, whether he sanctioned it, because there was very strict policy within Scientology not to allow intelligence agents, the newspaper uh, reporters uh, into the organization to receive services. Uh, any Scientologist that was suspected of being a plant or a spy was immediately kicked out. So the idea that uh, Pat Price was directly working this whole, you know, even the whole uh, uh, SRI uh, activities for a normal Scientologist, everyday Scientologist would have been strictly forbidden, but um, based on the fact that well, I... Ingo Swan was also a Scientologist. Right. He was very highly processed, highly trained Scientologist, and so was Hal Pudoff. Um And that's another little cute story because Hal years later, I think it was in 2004 and giving a talk, uh, made it seem as if it was just coincidental that they met. <laughs> when in fact, it's a very small community at that time in the late 60s uh, there in Hollywood. I mean, we're talking about the advanced organization of Scientology in Hollywood. It was like a about a 1700 square foot house they were operating out of. Uh, near downtown uh, Los Angeles. And the Celebrity Center? Well, the Celebrity Center was around the block from there, but uh, it was a small community, and they would have been definitely introduced by, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of the name Yvonne Gillum, Yvonne Gillum Gents. Yeah. She was the creator of the Celebrity Center, and she was like the super networking diva of all time as far as hooking up people. Uh, so... Anybody that had any kind of influence in any field, she knew about and was connecting them up. So Hal and Ingo, you know, I wasn't there to prove it 100%, but, you know, there's no way that they didn't know each other prior to uh, starting up this, um, you know, the remote viewing uh, operation. So, uh, and same with, now, I think Pat came along later, uh, may not have known Ingo, and uh, Hal prior to getting involved with you guys there at SRI, but uh, certainly Hal and uh, Ingo knew each other. Do you know how Pat happened to get in touch with Hal? Uh, I forget the story there. Uh, he was working selling Christmas trees or something up in uh, the Bay That's Area. Hal's story. I don't, I don't believe that for a minute. Okay. I mean, Pat was well up in the ranks of Scientology. Was an expert son, was an expert remote viewer in his own right that he somehow had learned, and he then called Hal. Okay. Now, I, so I don't believe, hey, the story is Hal says that Pat just read about us in the newspapers, and he called us. Now, from my point of view, is uh, I don't know anything about the inside of Scientology, but if they were both working in a celebrity center. It seemed to me that Hal must have run into Pat yeah. as a celebrity center and not selling Christmas trees in Mountain View. Yeah, I would agree. He may have been employed up there, but uh, he certainly would have been uh, tipped off by through this Yvonne uh, woman or just by being around. Because it's not a big, you know, uh, organization at that point in time. You know? But that's okay. The, Pat was a good friend of mine. And I don't happen to be a Scientologist, but uh, I was good friends with Pat and with Ingo. The fact that they were Scientologists, I just assumed that they became very psychic through their training, and I wish there was no problem. Right. Well, uh, believe it or not, this is a huge uh, point because over the years and decades now, um, you know, both Ingo and Hal distance themselves. So the, the connection to Scientology and remote viewing has sort of gotten lost, unacknowledged. 
Um, you know how I've never talked about Scientology. Or I talked about remote viewing. Well, Hubbard was, you know, we can talk about, I mean, he, he goes back to, uh, you know, it's very foundational concepts about, uh, you know, spiritual, mental abilities, uh, perceptions, and so forth. I mean, Ingo acknowledged in uh, publicly uh, in Scientology publications that his abilities directly relate or re came from um, his Scientological uh, processing that he went through. Um, I guess saying came from, he, we all inherently own them, but the development of bringing those out in people uh, was expedited through Scientology processes. I believe that. Um, and now what happened to Price? So we, we, we got him in, he's in his farmhouse in Virginia doing daily spying for the CIA. Right. And I can tell you one other thing that you may know. Shortly before he died, he bought a million dollars in term insurance for his wife. I didn't know that. And he gave that document to her at the airport before he flew off. Mm. So when Price died, uh, Anne learned that he died because somebody called her. But she already had this million dollar term insurance which is like cash money in her purse yeah and i know that that happened because she talked to other people about what should she do with his money mm. and of course different people had different ideas for her and i and i have no idea what she did yeah but i, but I price within within a week before he died he psychically knew that his life was in danger and bought his nice wife a million dollar term insurance. Yeah. Well, he was no fool. He was uh, probably a little uh, careless with what he told people and said, <laughs> particularly a government agency that uh, was known to not have uh, too many moral scruples. Uh, you know, if you go into MK Ultra and uh, Frank Olson stories and so forth. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, it was not not a very moral group, you could say. You know, uh, I would agree with that. <laughs> so, uh, but they left us alone. I mean, uh, I'm sort of a mild-mannered laser scientist, and I went to the CIA and said I've got this idea to teach people how to be psychic. And my my customer, Kit Green, who's a doctor, and Ken Kress, who's a physicist, both of those guys were high-level CIA people who always behaved very respectfully to me and let us publish the non-classified portion of our remote viewing in the scientific journal. So I was aware of the Scientology kills lots of people, but the money they gave us was untainted, I like to think, as we were doing... You mean, the CIA, doing, which is, you mean the CIA kills a lot of people, not Scientology. You said Scientology. I, don't, I, don't. I beg your pardon. I'm very sorry. Okay. The CIA killed a lot of people, but they left us alone. We could publish our work, and they gave us money when nobody else would. Well, my perspective on that, and, uh, you know, we will talk more and maybe you'll get a, a little better understanding of, uh, I'm a very highly advanced Scientologist, you could say. Uh, so uh, as long as um, it's all fun and games, I don't think it was perceived as a threat, but uh, Pat posed a threat. Yes. And I'm going to tell you one thing that he told me, maybe he told you, maybe he didn't, but um, I mean, we know that he was, I mean, when you go and you break into a, uh, psychically break into a NSA facility and start coming up with code numbers and whatnot, uh, that's a big threat right there. Absolutely. Uh, uh, that, you, you know, it's one thing to be uh, able to identify that somebody's out near a bridge or something, you know, uh, but when you start <laughs> playing with those boys, um, that's a high that's level. What they, that's what, that, what they, 
what Chris told me in the movie is that they felt that Price was really too psychic to be let loose with the likes of me. See, I, I was, I, I've been involved in psychic stuff all my life. It's a lifelong personal interest and in activity for me. So mm-hmm. Pat and I was were pretty. I wasn't in his class, but I was a pretty experienced remote viewer. Remote viewer, and the CIA hated the. And I even did a remote viewing in one of our formal studies when Price didn't show up, and I did a terrific job. That was one of their favorite things. I was turned in by a scientist, and that also upset them because I wasn't supposed to be doing that. So in the film, they say that they were troubled that uh, Pat was hanging around with these uh, enthusiasts at, ES- at SRI, and they his ability was so great that it was dangerous for him to be loose. Right. Well, I'm going to propose something, uh, just float a, a concept by you. Uh, but if Price was perceived as a threat, um, how much of a threat would be the organization or the processes that could potentially develop those types of abilities in vast numbers of people? That could, and, and I'm basing this on, there's a theory in my own personal view, is the reason the Church of Scientology was infiltrated and taken over, and the reason you see so much craziness in the news about that organization is... Oh, let me have a timeout. What is your telephone number, please? 615. You're in Nashville. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anyway. I wanted that because I think we're probably going to be shouting again. Okay. (laughs) Um, Well, anyway. So Scientology may have appeared to be a threat. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I don't want to get off on that tangent too much because that's a whole big uh, story and uh, whatnot. Uh, Keep it to just uh, Pat. But um, if, you know, if he had these abilities and was a threat, then I think it's logical and you don't have to be, you know, too much of, it's not a stretch to consider that any organization or the processes uh, that would, uh, are, were acknowledged by the key players in that uh, effort, in their research, uh, having come from Scientology, uh, had to be neutralized and, uh, uh, you know, negated. So, there's a lot of history uh, that connected to that. Um, so well, I, I believe that that's true. That, that that's that's my theory is that he scared them and they killed him. Do you do you have any reason to believe that other than it sort of makes sense? Well, I was. Did he ever, did I, he ever tell you that he felt in danger? No, but the last time I saw him. Uh, there was a couple of things. He told me this was when I, you know, he told me he was working for this coal company. And then um, the the kicker was, you see, like with uh, remote viewing, you're implying uh, that you're seeing using a perception of sight. Uh, just in, you know, in, it's part of the, the terminology there. But there's other perceptics. L. Ron Hubbard in 1951 listed out 55 perceptics. One of those is sound. And along with sound, there's pitch, tone, volume, rhythm. So there's a lot of nuances to the perception of sound. Pat told me that he was listening to conversations, Russian conversations he mentioned, but that um i think take took the no he couldn't speak russian nobody was able to i guess mimic i don't know i mean uh mimic the words or the sounds of what he heard 
basically he was hearing as well as viewing. So now, wasn't that a big jump for you if you thought he was in a coal company? And by the way, I'm hearing Russian conversations. So did you know he was working with the CIA at that time? Yeah, you know that uh, you're right. That does that's illogical. And I'm trying to think what was his, uh, the connection? How would he let me know? Because it was never like a statement. I'm working for the CIA. You know, uh, I think it was in remote. It was in the context of remote viewing. Because he told me other stories about what he was coming up with, probably stuff that you know about, you know, the, the UFO bases, where they're located, the, the passive sonar off the coast of California near Catalina, um, you know, things like that. Um, so I think it was in the context of his normal remote viewing. Oh, hey, by the way, you know, I was able to... Uh, listen to some Russian <laughs> conversation. But I didn't I didn't put it together that he was working for the CIA. It was like, you know, uh, you don't know where those Russians were. No. But just the fact that he was picking up audio, you see, yes. took it to another level of threat. Because it's one thing to say, oh, okay, he can see our documents, but we can cover them up or whatever. But we have no safe room. Well, there's no room in the basement of the White House or Langley or anywhere that we can get away from this guy. So, so within the Scientology tech, that people speak about uh, remote listening as well. Well, uh, within Scientology, the term remote viewing is not part of Scientology. It's, uh, you know, that's invented by, you know, Ingo, I think, coined that term. Yes. It's not part of the Scientology tech, per se, but the idea of being exterior. We talk about being exterior from the body, being able to perceive things in our past. And by the way, when you talk, spoke with George Norrie the other night, he asked you about, can you remote view uh, the past? And I would just say that from my perspective in Scientology tech is you can very much uh, not only view your own past, but any recordings of others. Um, so the history of the of other people and our events can be scanned and uh, data can be pulled. In other words, the memory is not lost. If I wasn't there, I can find somebody who was and I can psychically pick up on their memory and their recall, even if they can't um, you know, consciously say, yeah, it was on July 3rd, 1984 at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. Nevertheless, the memory recording is there and it can be pulled out of them. That's very interesting. Yeah. Now, we never did that as a research task because the, 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 the confusion, if you tell me, um, did you remember I did something when I was a kid? And then you ask me, is that true? And then I tell you, uh, yes, that's what I did. I'm sort of giving you feedback, and we don't know whether you got that information from the past, as your experience would dictate, or from the future where you got feedback. Right. Well, and that's, you know, the... Um you've run into it uh proof people want proof <laughs> you know um you know you there are you did a lot of experimentation and uh and you did some great things in providing proof in fact i'm sure it's the most scientific approach to documenting the uh extra extra abilities extra normal abilities uh, that humans possess, um, but like uh, the phenomenon of going, being outside the body, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, um, and so forth. Um, L. Ron Hubbard talks about that. You know, the proof is when somebody experiences it themselves, they know that they're outside their body. You know, yeah. But you cannot, uh, you can't see a nothing, because the person, the individual, the spiritual being, is a nothingness. So. Um, 
you know, proving it until and unless we're not there yet, but I think theoretically and potentially spiritual beings are, are capable of moving matter. Uh, there is telekinesis. People have demonstrated that it's sort of sporadic and not really, uh, you know, under their control or something that can be uh, put in a laboratory. But uh, nevertheless, theoretically, uh, being able to move objects is this is the potential. But is there a Scientology term for being able to hear something when you're exterior? Uh, it would be the audio. Just turning on audio is because I this, see. Just like other perceptics, if you're exterior, you can uh, uh, be aware of the, the angle of your body position, whether you're prone or uh, upright. Um, you know, or uh, other perceptics of uh, heat and cold, uh, temperature. Uh, like I said, there's 50 different perceptions. Did he ever tell you that he listened in on anything besides the the Russians? No, it was just that one sort of almost a throwaway comment, you know, in his in laugh afterwards, you know, it was like kind of, you know, he was, you know, just Pat was a playful, you know. Uh, he was just kind of uh, outgoing and gregarious and this was... Yes. He would talk very, out very amiable. He would toss out these things. Oh, by the way, you know, I uh, remote viewed where the UFO bases are on planet Earth today. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, oh, well, that's interesting, Pat. Where are they? <laughs> you know, and uh, now, did you have any uh, further idea that, that somebody killed him or how that might have happened? No, I just like. Or, or who, who is the guy who was with him? There's sort of a mystery person was with him in Las Vegas, and I don't know who that was. Yeah, I don't either off the top of my head. It seems like I read that, who it was. Uh, it's somewhere. But I... You can get a lot of uh, stories if you go to the Internet and look for the mysterious death of Pat Price. Yeah, that's probably where I saw it. Uh, Somebody wrote a lengthy document about that and, and named a person who was with Price, but that's a name that was not familiar to me, and I never uh, searched on the name. Yeah, I think I read that, uh, you know, uh, web page uh, that you're talking about, and uh, but I don't remember the name, and I don't have it in front of me, so I don't know. But uh, uh, there's one little point of curiosity. I remember one time he was... Uh, we were in the kitchen in Hollywood, and he mentioned that he'd been given a test. And I think he uh, mentioned you that you had told him, and it might not be, it might have been Hal, but it was either you or Hal had told him that he had missed a question. And one of the questions was the distance between New York and London. And he said, well, go, go back and recheck it. And when you rechecked it, you found that his distance was correct if you take a straight line through the earth between New York and London. Do you recall that? Either? Huh? I I I, I don't recall that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. Maybe it was Hal, uh, but you know, it just there's these little scraps of uh, conversation and uh, uh, things of interest that he, uh, you know, he was a big, larger than life figure at that time. I was a young man, you know, I was in my twenties, and uh, here he was. He was probably, you know, he. Had, man of the world and he's talking about you know doing these experiments and he was able to do all these things so you know i was quite impressed with him do you talk to ann at the time that price died no she was uh, you know uh, i saw her once i was at the uh, there was a memorial service at the celebrity center which uh Heber Gents, who was the president of the church at the time, he officiated the memorial service for Pat there. I was uh, the hell put up that I were there. Were you? Well, then we've met or we've crossed paths in person. My memory is that that was an open coffin, so you can see Price lying there. Yeah, I think you're right. And Ken Chris says in my movie, that he was cremated, so they don't know anything about what killed him, and that's obviously a lie. Uh, 
Well, at the memorial at Celebrity Center, um, huh. I don't. My memory is that he was in a sort of highly decorated large coffin. He was fully dressed, of course, and he looked like he was resting in peace. But it was definitely Price. Was that in Hollywood or because uh, he was born? It was Celebrity Center. Okay. The memor- there was a memorial at the Celebrity Center. Yeah. That's what I. We, we, that's where Hal and I were. Okay. Well, he very mal. He might have been cremated afterwards. I don't know. You know. I would. Yeah. What what the CIA said is that they were not able to do a. Everyone wants to know what is what killed this great psychic. And Kit Green says on camera, we, we never know because he was uh, immediately um, cremated. And that's a lie. Yeah. Well, which make, which make me super suspicious. Yeah. Well, I um, I wish I had made a mental note or uh, taken note that uh, or a journal or something at the time because uh, you know at then I didn't know that this would be of a, a great historical significance. You know, he was somebody that I knew. Now you wrote you wrote to me and you said that you you know something about the death of Pat Price or you have suspicions. Well, that so what, what was your suspicion? Well, based on the fact that he reported that he could hear conversations, I think that took it to another level. So that's my suspicion that when, you know, it's one thing to view documents or view uh, people in places, but to hear conversations, I think that's what put his life in jeopardy. Very interesting. And and the only time he told you is that he was listening to something in Russian. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's very interesting, and it's certainly something I didn't know. Yeah, well, it's uh, stuck with me um, all these years. I've never uh, doubted that, uh, you know, he was, it was not accidental or, uh, I mean, I don't know, supposedly he never mentioned that he had a heart issue to me. Uh, never heard of that until after the fact. But the heart issue is um, different things for different. I have a heart issue and a pacemaker, and I'm 85 years old. So when I was working with Price, uh, he was like 10 years older than me, and he looked like an older man. But from where I'm standing now, he doesn't seem like an old man. He seems like a young man. Yeah. It's surprising how, how young it gets as you get older. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, neither one of us were there. Uh, but when you, you know, put two and two together, the fact uh, the coincidental that he was uh, – uh, coming up with all this information, he was perceived as a threat in the history of that organization, the, the CIA, I mean. Um, it just, uh, it wouldn't surprise me. And uh, Did he tell you that he was perceived as a threat or that what you deduced from the audio? Oh, that's what I deduced from the audio. I had, I, that had crossed my mind when he told me he was, you know, uh, doing all this stuff. I thought, well, that's, that's interesting because, like I said earlier, it's kind of a violation of Scientology principles to be going off. And, you know, I was wondering how he got sanctioned to do that research. He must have been uh, with the now, blessing. No, I can tell you a little. We know that he was audited every day. Right. And the girl that I... And my so girl, those documents have now surfaced. Yeah. And my girlfriend worked for, like I said, the top... Uh, executive of the church at that time and they would chit chat about him being over there earlier in the day so he was going to their offices so there was a pipeline of you know what he whatever he was doing he was reporting to the church and that would that direct pipeline would go up through his uh, now, marriage. No, no, no. 
Now, he was living in Virginia. Where we're talking, he, he died in June of 75. But he was living in Virginia. So, um... Well, he was, and, he was, and he was being audited, we know. But I didn't know that he ever got back to Virginia. He ever got back to L.A. Well, um, the exact timeline, I'd have to, uh, you know... When tough. did you ever see him? Well, he was he was traveling a lot with his wife was living at the house, and he was traveling a lot. Then she would be gone, and so we just kind of kept this place. But there was we had that house for I'm going to say about a year or a year and a half. So he had a house in L.A. all the time. Yeah, and I did not know, I did not know that. Yeah, because uh, like I say, the wife was getting uh, her auditing in in Los Angeles, and. Uh, he would come and visit. He would then he would go. So he was, you know, in and out on the road. Up, uh, you know, I, I I didn't know the that it was Virginia, but I knew he was working for a coal company, and so I didn't. So, it, so maybe he did not. I understood. See, there's a lot of documents uh, available about things that Price had to say. Um, during the time that he was working with the CIA, and I assumed that he had an auditor either come to him or that he was doing auditing. Over the, can you do auditing over the telephone? Not then, no. Uh, now we can do it over Skype, but um, no, you don't do auditing over the telephone. So he would have had, at that time, he would have had either someone, if he had an auditor in Virginia, I don't know, or he, when he came to Los Angeles, he would add an auditor there. Uh, he was, there's, a, there's a lot of documents. The thing that upset CIA is that a lot of documents that they still consider top secret. So uh, I made up that he could have been uh, doing auditing over the telephone because I'm ignorant, or the auditor came to him which would have been pretty risky because he was out there quite isolated and it'd be obvious of any, whoever he had visitors for, he wasn't locked in, but he was pretty isolated. But the, the easy answer is that he came to the Celebrity Center periodically. Yeah, and, and you know, he was probably uh, reporting, like I, I know for a fact, at least on one occasion, where he had been to the the top executives' offices on a particular day in Hollywood. Um, so it's likely that he was uh, reporting to uh, uh, that branch of Scientology is well known for having a very sophisticated uh, spy network of their own. They were the ones. They were the ones that were busted for having infiltrated IRS offices and other government offices to. Uh, extract documents that the government had on the church. <laughs> so um, these were not, these were professional uh, people as far as gathering intel on uh, who was looking at the church, who were potential threats to the church. And uh, my personal theory is I think L. Ron Hubbard probably liked the idea or thought it was kind of um, interesting to to let it play out where people that had benefited from his discoveries were being tested scientifically. And he probably uh, thought, well, let's let, let this play out and uh, see if it gives some validation. Uh, because he'd been fighting for bona fide, you know. Uh, oh, yeah, definitely. He'd been trying to uh, achieve a legitimacy, and that was the whole strategy behind Celebrity Center was to get celebrities to endorse Scientology and thereby bring it into, you know, recognition and uh, acceptability and not just the cult label, you know. Uh, so he was battling a lot of uh, dark forces who wanted to smear Scientology, smear his research. Um, so it wasn't, uh, uh, I mean, it's quite understandable that he uh, developed a, uh, a network of, you know, information sources 
to uh, be able to counteract the smear campaign. Yeah, yeah, protect them as hell. Yeah. Uh, now, from your intuition, do you have any feeling for what or who killed Pat? Well, I um, I believe it's the CIA. You know, I mean, uh, they were the ones threatened. Uh, I don't. I doubt that it would have been the Soviets at that time. I don't. I mean, who knows? You know, is that whole. Uh, you know, that crowd <laughs> is, is kind of like, you know, they're uh, they're all of the same sort of ilk, you know. Do you have any intuition of what killed him? No, I haven't looked into it. I mean, I could take it on as a project to uh, try to extract more data, but there's no way of proving it. Intuition is, uh, I mean, they have very sophisticated poisons. I mean, the whole MK Ultra had been to uh, develop whatever agents, you know, from LSD on down the whole pharmacological catalog of stuff was at their disposal. So uh, the report was that somebody just bumped into him and then he got, that's what after that bump, he fell ill. So who knows, he could have been a, a quick uh, needle jab uh, of something. Um, but, the information is available. It's not something that I've taken on, or I don't, I'm not sure I want to go digging too deeply because um, I've got other things. Uh, and also, I don't know if I want to poke a stick into that hornet's nest. <laughs> so it's, I mean, I don't know how else to, if, if that satisfies. So he died in Las Vegas in convulsions. So it's as though he had some kind of nerve agent. Yeah. And the Russians are expert in that. And we, who knows what the science all is. This is 1975. The Russians were working on nerve agents. I assume that we were as well. Uh, the Russians have been caught using nerve agents. Uh, we have not been caught yet. Yeah. Yeah, it's a dirty business, and I think, uh, you know, he was, well, even based on what you, what you knew about, um, he was a threat. He was take, He took it to another level, and, uh, you know, I think uh, right along with that, any organization or uh, uh bank or battery of uh did he think that he was a threat did, did he express did, did he indicate that he was worried no not to me he always had that you know that just that uh cocky uh i can do anything i mean one time uh before we got the house together we went up to uh his place in northern california and i remember sitting on the living room floor at their house and he dem he was demonstrating how he could break boards, you know, his karate expertise. So he was, uh, you know, he just had, a, a, there's an attitude and I think that was part of his psychic abilities is he just didn't see barriers. You know, he saw, he didn't see walls. He saw the outdoors, he saw the flowers, you know, and uh, he didn't consider him Self uh, mortal, he was immortal, <laughs> and he was very uh, outgoing and friendly. Yeah. Do you think that he learned uh, remote viewing at the Scientology, or did, is that a gift that he came with? Uh, he probably had that from his, you know, from very young. Uh, but what Scientology processes do is they eliminate some of the barriers that people run into. I know that there's a concept that I'm sure you, that you know is analytical overlay. Yes, um, indeed. So if you can eliminate those, there's a lot of mental factors, uh, analytical overlay that comes in. There's a thing called, we call circuits, you know, that little, when you hear a tune and then you can't get it out of your head type of thing, those mm -hmm. are mental circuits. Well, there's techniques to eliminate those things. So if you can clear the deck, so to speak, now you can see the floor better. So... Your engram is an idea that's in Scientology and is also in Freudian psychology. Right. There's just sort of... Engrams are a kind of analytical overlay. 
Right. Yeah, those are uh, traumatic incidents in a person's past. So let's, you know, theoretically, if a person had been uh, hit by a car in front of a ice cream shop when he was young, well, coming along 30, 40 years later, he might, uh, when he passes an ice cream shop, uh, experience some uh, some somatic, some some physical pain or replay. replay. So. Uh, someone doing remote viewing if they're tasked to look at something and they bump into these mental image we call them mental image pictures yeah. um, that you know are outside of their control then that's going to block their perception of what they're trying to look at and uh so uh unless i forget here i wanted to uh just extend to you an offer that if there's ever an opportunity that comes up or some event or something where uh, a demonstration or uh, a, a chance to run some students through some basic drills uh, based on Scientology principles, um, we could uh, talk about doing something like that. If that okay, ever... that would be very interesting. Uh, I'm not teaching anymore. You know, teaching remote viewing uh, takes a lot out of you. Yeah. Because you really got to integrate with the person you're teaching. And I, I did a lot of teaching after I left Lockheed for about 20 years. And it sort of wears you out because yeah. of your responsibility. So I decided to make a film instead. Yeah, by the way, I want to definitely, uh, I love the um, the. Uh, you know the trailer for that and it's very i'm very excited to i'll be really excited to see it uh, well, a couple of months we'll have it out there yeah and well, they're very respectful toward pat of course well and he was a totally fine man there's no reason not to be respectful toward him yeah he was a huge you know he looms uh large in my uh you know uh history of people that I've known and uh, he's quite an impressive person. And uh, I, uh, you know, I just, I cherish the fact that I knew him and, uh, um, you know, he's just, a, he's a great guy. So, um, well, I, uh, I was just trying to think if there was something else. Uh, I was gonna I, think of something, give me a call. I'm, I'm eager to know what went on. Even if I can share it, I want to have the story right. I don't want to say anything that's not true. So give me a call if you think of anything. I'm very happy to talk to you. I very, very much appreciate your sharing this with me. Well, I appreciate. I got a. I got a. Uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, serendipity that I uh, happen to be listening to George Nori. Uh, and caught you that way, but uh, it, it was just uh, very interesting to me, some of the things you said about um, remote viewing and Pat, and I could tell that you you shared my perspective that he was a superstar of the remote viewing oh, world, yeah. uh, even though, of course, you know, I, I never met Ingo, but, uh, you know, and I'm sure that he his contributions were tremendous as well, but, uh, uh, Pat, I think, uh, you know, was just a step above, and uh, his his abilities were, uh, uh, you know, it's just great that you're documenting it, and uh, and people are going to hear and learn more about that name. I, I think you'll like the film. Are you in, are you involved in songwriting? No, no, I just happen to have uh, a connection to Nashville. Uh, you, I lived in Southern California for. 30 some years and then I moved here about 10 years dozen years ago you ever go to the bluebird cafe yeah I have been there yeah because I had a girlfriend who was a songwriter in Nashville <clears throat> I spent a lot of time with her and she performed at the bluebird cafe yeah one of those classic old Nashville places this town has changed I mean it's like California was 30 40 years ago Everybody what changed during the five years I was working with her is they used to pay her to come and sing, and by the time the five years were over, she had to pay them <laughs> for the opportunity to showcase her, her music, 
there were so many people who wanted to come. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the music is great here. If you're ever, uh, it is. If you're ever uh, in this neck of the woods again, definitely uh, let me know. We'll, uh, we'll get together. I'd like to do that. I'm, again, very grateful for your call. I thank you for your help. Okay, Russell, you take care. and Thank you so much. It was great talking to you. Bye-bye. All right, bye.